Hi everyone, how are you? It's day eight of my um, I Survived the Sinking of the Titanic read aloud. Roy was just here, but some truck went by. I think he'll be back. So um, I wanna start out by um, saying hello to you all. I hope you're all well. And I'll do my shout outs to start out with. So today I'm saying special hellos to Liam and Owen, to the fourth graders of Ridge Elementary, to Mrs. Lane's fifth graders at TJR Elementary, to the students of Zachary Taylor Elementary, the fourth graders of Ridge Elementary, to Eli, to Sam and Sydney, to the Riley kids, my special friends, and to Blake and Paisley. Okay, well, we're almost done. I can't believe it. And this is not gonna be a long read aloud today because we just have two very short chapters. So, and we left on a very happy note, which is that um, Marco and, and George had been saved. They had been in a lifeboat and these, these lights appeared and it turned out to be the, the Carpathia. Um, a ship that had come to, um, to rescue the survivors of the Titanic. And as, as the ship got closer up on the deck, um, there were Aunt Daisy, Phoebe, and Enzo all safe. So we know that um, just like the name of this book, everyone came through this safely. So now let's see what's going to happen with George next. We're at chapter 15. Those first two days on the Carpathia were a blur. George mostly slept on a bed of blankets and pillows on the floor of the first class lounge, but he sensed that Phoebe and Aunt Daisy never left his side. He, heard, he sometimes heard Enzo singing softly to him in Italian, his breath hot on George's cheek. He heard Aunt Daisy and Phoebe talking about Marco, whose feet were badly frozen, about the Carpathia's passengers who couldn't do enough for them all, about the hundreds and hundreds of people who didn't make it out of the water. Slowly, George felt stronger, and on their last night at sea, he was able to go out onto the deck with Phoebe. They sat on a bench wrapped in a blanket. A stewardess came over and gave each of them a mug of warm milk. Phoebe looked up at the sky as she warmed her hands on her mug. I finally saw a shooting star, she said, when I was on a lifeboat. You can guess what I wished for. George reached for her hand. Yes, of course he knew. On the bench next to him sat two women. Both were crying. Probably they'd lost their husbands or brothers or fathers. There hadn't been enough wishing stars for everyone that night. Phoebe said that only about 700 of them made it out of the water. Phoebe leaned in close to George. Her coat smelled like rose water. A lady from the Carpathia had given it to her. Have you wondered, she asked quietly, if maybe there really was a curse? At first, didn't, George didn't understand that Phoebe was talking about the mummy. With all that had happened, George hadn't thought about it. But now it hit him. How strange it was that the ship had collided with an iceberg at the exact moment the scar-faced man had opened the lid of Mr. Burroughs's cake crate. I guess we'll never know, George said. But the, nefty, but the next evening, as the Carpathia was closing in on New York Harbor, George and Phoebe overheard a skinny man with a beard speaking to an officer. Before the Titanic, I was traveling in Egypt, a place called Thebes, the man said. I explored a magnificent tomb of a royal family. Phoebe's eyes bugged out. And before George could stop her, she had marched over to the man. Excuse me, she said, are you Mr. Burroughs? Yes, I am, the man replied. Phoebe took a big breath. Mr. Burroughs, she said, this might sound like a very strange question, but did you bring a mummy on board the Titanic? The man looked at Phoebe. A mummy, he said. Yes, she said. We heard it was a princess. Mr. Burroughs's eyes were tired and sad, but he smiled a little. My princess, he said. Yes. So there was a mummy? Phoebe exclaimed. No, child, he said. One should never take a mummy from a tomb. That is very bad luck. Princess was my cat. She passed away on my trip to Egypt, and so I had her wrapped so I could bring her back with me. So the princess was a cat? Yes, he said sadly, the most beautiful cat that had ever lived. <laughs>
Three hours later, just after 9 o'clock, the Carpath Carpathia docked in New York City in a thunderstorm. There were thousands of people waiting on the pier. But the first person George saw as they walked down the gangplank was Papa. He rushed up to George and Phoebe, grabbing them both and pulling them to him. All around them, people cried with happiness. Others just cried, their tears mixing with the pouring rain. They introduced Papa to Marco and Enzo, but there wasn't much time to talk. Their train to Millerstown was leaving soon, and an ambulance was waiting to take Marco to the hospital. Luckily, George didn't have to say a real goodbye to Marco and Enzo. Aunt Daisy was staying in New York City to take care of Enzo until Marco's feet were healed, and then they would come with her for a visit to Millerstown. Seeing the way Marco and Aunt Daisy were looking at each other, George wondered if maybe Marco and Enzo would stay forever. George sure hoped so. As they rode to the train station, newsboys screamed from every street corner, Read all about it! Titanic survivors in New York! More than 1,500 people lost! Read all about it! George covered his ears. He wanted to forget everything about the Titanic. He wanted to put it out of his mind forever. So that's the end of chapter 15. Here's chapter 16. But George couldn't forget. Even back on the farm, surrounded by friends from school and neighbors from town, he felt like he was drifting on a dark ocean. And each day they went by, he felt himself drifting farther away. At night, when he got into bed, he'd see the faces of all those scare people on G-deck. He'd see the ship disappearing into the sea. He'd remember the stabbing cold and the screams of hundreds of people crying for help. He didn't bother trying to fall asleep. Each night, after Phoebe and Papa were in bed, he would go into the woods. He was, hide he was heading back into the house one night when he heard a noise through the bushes. Something was there. He could sense it. The panther? He took out his knife, fighting the urge to run away, and peered through the branches. George stared in shock. It was Papa. He was sitting on a large rock, looking up at the sky, smoking a pipe. He looked like he'd been there for some time. George turned. Papa turned. He didn't look especially surprised to see George. Sorry to give you a scare, he said. What are you doing here, Papa? George asked. Don't know, Papa said. Sometimes I just come here when I can't sleep. George couldn't believe it. How many nights had they both been out here in the woods at the same time? Papa eased himself off the rock and began walking back toward the house. I'll take you up to your bed. No, Papa, George said. I come to the woods too. Papa looked at him with a very slight smile. I know that, he said. Papa knew? What else did Papa know about George? What else didn't George know about Papa? He and, Papa, he and his father looked at each other, really looked, for the first time in a long while, maybe since Mama passed away. Suddenly, George started to cry. They looked at him. They took him by surprise, his tears, and he couldn't stop. He cried for all those people who didn't make it out of the water. He cried because somehow he did. He cried because he knew that no matter how much time went by, a part of him would be out in that ocean, and he would never forget. Papa held George's hand and they didn't and didn't say a word, and then he led George over to the boulder where they both sat together under the stars. George stared up at the sky. Were those really the same stars that had burned so brightly above the black ocean that night? Was he really the same boy, George, who couldn't stay out of trouble? George, who didn't try hard at school? George, who found the escape ladders? George, who poured, pulled Marco out of that lifeboat, who didn't give up? They sat on the boulder for a long time, and as the sun started to peep over the trees, George told Papa about Mr. Andrews. He said I thought I'd build a ship one day. Papa didn't laugh. He puffed on his pipe, looking thoughtful. How about we build one together, Papa said. A nice little boat for the pond. I've always wanted to do that. That's a good idea, George said. A great idea. We could start today, Papa said, standing up and holding out his hand. They walked back to the house together. The birds were singing softly. The chickens were squawking for breakfast. A breeze was whispering through the trees, and a voice seemed to sing to George very softly. Awake, awake, it's now daybreak, but don't forget your dreams. Papa looked out into the woods like he could hear it too. And that is the end of our read aloud of I Survived the Sinking of the Titanic. I really hope you liked this book, which was my very first I Survive book. I'm going to pick something else to read to you beginning next week. So keep an eye out and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.